at, at, at a variety of different levels. Yeah, yeah that's, that's where this is, that's important. So, so normally my end question is, is there anything else that we need to talk about? And the answer to that is obviously there's a lot more things that we need to talk about. But we're, at, we're close to an hour here. So for me, this is, if, if you were me and you're sitting in my pot, nice little comfortable podcast chair here, and you want to take this conversation to the next level or the next step and dig a little bit deeper, where, we, where, where do we need to go? Um, <laughs> what, what are the things that, you know, for me, I think that we need to talk more about is men and their mm-hmm. mental and emotional um, health. Uh, because having two adult sons, um, I, I now feel really good about the fact that we can discuss anything with them. Uh, and we've talked about, you know, the perception of men not being able to talk about emotions. And Kevin, I think we've talked about this in the last time. But I do think um, men are starting to open up a little bit and we just need to give them permission. So I think you're in a really good position to discuss men's um, mental and emotional wellness. I don't know how you feel about that, but I'd love that. I'd listen to that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Agree or Disagree, the podcast. It is Kevin Olenek. You can add me as a friend on Facebook, Kevin Olenek. Like Agree or Disagree, the podcast on Facebook as well. Follow me on Twitter at K-E-V-O-L-E, SoundCloud.com, K-E-V-O-L-E, Spreaker.com, K-E-V-O-L-E, and subscribe on iTunes, Agree or Disagree, the podcast, and subscribe on YouTube as well. I would like to start our podcast today with a couple of quotes that I was reading. My dad came from a generation where no one talked about mental illness or suicide. Men in particular showed no vulnerability or signs of struggle, psychological or physical. To show any emotion was to appear weak, and real men were not weak. I never saw my father cry. I don't remember any physical signs of love from him like hugs and kisses. That was written by Reverend Robert Cook, who lost his 75-year-old father to suicide last year. I have suffered from depression since I was 16 or 17. I have never talked about it. It hasn't served me to not talk about it, as the bouts of depression get deeper and longer. Those are the words from our guest today, Brian Pinko. Pink, is it? And one in can- this is from the Canadian Mental Health Association. One in ten-, 10 Canadian men will experience major depression in the course of their lives. Three out of four suicides are men. The Canadian Mental Health Association also says this. It's being called a silent crisis, a sleeper issue. But there are signs that this sleeper is at least awakening. Around the world studies, surveys, and web network journals, and newspaper articles are shedding light on a shadowy subject, men's mental health. If you heard our conversation around kids and mental health, and you heard from the beginning here, Alicia Perot suggested that we do need to have a conversation around men. So tonight on Agree or Disagree the podcast, or whenever you're listening to this, we talk about men and mental health. And former Calgary City Councilor Brian Pinko was first elected in 2007 at his Ward 11 seat and decided not to seek re-election in the 2017. He has opened up about his journey since then, and we welcome him today on Agree or Disagree podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Great to be here. And and my T's aren't silent, by the way. Oh, your T's pin caught. I know. I come from Quebec, but I'm, it's not Franco. Okay. I yeah. Heard- I apologize. I've heard it both no, ways. Okay. I've heard it both ways. I believe me. I've been called worse. Um, so for those that are listening here, I think I also want to say that this is going to be not an easy topic. It's never an no. easy topic when we talk about stuff like this. Uh, so if this is something that is not easy for you, I encourage you to listen in your own pace. 
never wrong to pause and go back to something that you heard again and take mm -hmm. those times to recharge, re-energize, and everything like that, uh, because it is important. And I guess the best way to start is kind of talk about what led you to t open up about your <laughs> journey and your struggle. And we had uh, some conversations off air that I think are going to help where this goes as well. But uh, maybe start from what made you decide it's time to share your story? Boy, I'm not sure if I actually decided. Um, it was a World Suicide Prevention Day, and I have raised awareness uh, um, about mental health and working to de-stigmatize de um, mental health. And um, the uh, and so it was World Suicide Prevention Day, and uh, I was on social media. I was on Twitter, and I was raising awareness. And, and in a series of about five tweets, and one in the middle of that, I just said, "You never know who it could be." I have just come out of four and a half years of a deep, deep depression where suicide was very close. Uh, so you never know who it could be. And it was just in the middle of that. And, uh, oh, it was about an hour later when the media called me and said, hey, do you want to talk about this? And I was like, oh, crap. Um, am I actually ready? And I, I had to spend a fair amount of time with myself to go, am I strong enough to do this now? And in the end, I decided, but it was unintentional that I would, that I actually put myself in that position. I didn't, I didn't say, Hey, I'm going to talk about it. And to do, it was just a, uh, wow. Okay. I guess I'm in, might as well go all in. How do you, how did you feel about that? It, did you feel uh, kind of on the spot? It sounds like you were put on the spot a little bit. Well, I, and I had to, they, I mean, uh, the media called and, and they were, uh, they were very respectful. Um, and if I had chosen not to say anything, I, I believe that that would have been respected. Um, so I didn't honestly feel like I was on the spot other than, I had to make a decision whether I was strong enough at that point to be able to talk about it. And that was a year ago, a year ago. Yeah. Just over a year ago. Um, so I talked about it and it was all that I could do not to, um, for the next two days, lock the door, go in the corner of my room and cover myself with a blanket and hide. It was all that I could do not to do that. I, I, uh, I was not prepared for the response. Uh, I thought it, I was just being selfish and egocentric and talking about it. And why had I done that? Um, I, um, I worried that people were going to make fun of me and that never happened. Um, uh, and, uh, but I just, I just, it, it was just emotionally so overwhelming that, you know, I, I just wanted to turtle and hide and I had a job to do and I had to go into city hall every day and sit in city council meetings. And so hiding was not an option. Hmm. and your response from your call did you have maybe let's before this before it right. became public before you tweeted about it yeah. were there people in your work circle in your in your community circle that were aware and what was what were those conversations like uh <laughs> no they weren't aware uh i you know i <laughs> I felt for years, I felt like a hypocrite because I was working to destigmatize mental health and mental, mental illness, saying it is just an illness like having your tonsils infected or whatever. Um, and uh, so I was very vocal about destigmatizing, and yet I could never talk about my own. 
uh, where I was at. So I felt very much like a hypocrite. I, until I came out like that, um, I had really only talked about it with my partner, with my doctor, with my counselor, and with uh, two of my best friends. Uh, and that was it. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I think my colleagues on city council who are around me all the time, I think they knew something was up. Cause one of my, one of the things that happens with me is I stop, eat, I stop sleeping and I stop eating. And in the summer of 2014, uh, I lost 35 pounds and, uh, I, I would go days without eating. Um, and, uh, still doing my job and doing the work, but I would go days without eating. And uh, just because I couldn't, I just couldn't. I either wasn't interested or if I had three bites, I was full and that was it. Um, So they noticed uh, that. um, But, you know, you get uh, in a way, you get positive reinforcement to that. You want to talk about another stigma, this weight stigma. Mm. And, you know, as I'm losing weight because of my depression, I've got everybody around me saying, whoa, you're looking really good. Uh, and so you get, you get positive reinforcement for a symptom of a, something that is killing you, mm. which is which there is a double stigma going on. It's yeah, that's uh, that's it, it's interesting, sort of and uh, that whole what we look at, like our focus on losing weight as a society as a, a, a yeah. positive thing. And yeah, it's well, I have to say my 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 partner uh, did her PhD in looking at weight stigma and how it affects uh, healthcare. So hmm. uh, yes, I. I have a, a stigma warrior as a partner. Yes. Uh, I, I, I watch her Facebook posts and <laughs> I, <laughs> <There's> no- <laughs> I, I see what she does. And it's, you know, and I think that that's like, just on a side note, I think it's great. And I think it's really important the stuff that she yeah. brings up. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, no, that's she, she incites conversation. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're going through, you know, this, um, you you're people are giving you positive affirmation about losing weight, and yet inside you're you're feeling depressed. Um, it's it's kind of like I almost don't know what to ask in that in this sense. Like, yeah, where, where do you where, where, where all it does is it just it just further cuts out uh, social interaction. You mm-hmm. just just want to hide more and more you know um uh people so i yeah i started talking about it i um i had and i was on recover was in recovery as i was talking about it um but as i was able to talk about it because i you know i'd been uh i'd been in uh, when i spoke about it i'd been uh what I would say in treatment. So seeing a doctor, seeing a counselor, taking medication for a couple of years. And I, um, I, at that point I felt strong enough that I could talk about it. Um, and then after I did, I was like, Ooh, I don't know if I was strong enough. Um, but it, it, um, it manifested differently in everybody, right? And I think that too was one of the fears that I had had then, and I certainly have now, is that you know I talk about tell us what depression is and tell us what it's like, and I'm like I can only tell you what my experience of it is, um, and uh, other people will experience it differently, and other people will need different things. Uh, and so I am beyond being able to talk about my experience. I, 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 I'm nothing, I can do nothing more than that. Um, but it's, uh, you, for me, uh, I, I whittled my life 
down to what I felt I could cope with. And what I could cope with was doing my job and trying to do my job. Uh, as part of my depression, I felt like it was letting absolutely buddy, everybody in my life down. And the only solution I saw was to cut people out of my life. Um, and, uh, because at least if I cut them out of my life, they'll have one big disappointment and then they'll forget about me. Um, and I did that to family. I did it to friends. Uh, and, um, you know, around city hall, I withdrew. I did my job. I focused on my job. If I can just do my job, I can survive. If I can just not let my constituents down, I can survive. And I just focused on that. Um, but to be in public or to, you know, to sit in it, because part of the job is very public, was just eroded the hell out of me. And being in being in the public means you have to be in a sense in some way, shape, or form, perform in an extroverted way. Yeah, I'm a hardcore introvert, by the way. Hardcore. Yeah. Um uh yeah, and and I I thought and you know, people were like, How are you an introvert and depressed and you can do this? And I go, Well, you know what, I think of it as uh putting on a mask or putting on a uniform. I know how to be the public politician and I can play that and I can do that. I come from a theater background too, right? So I worked in theater for 20 years. So I understood the role and I knew how to pull it off. And, uh, in those kind of public settings, um, but, it, every time I did it, it took such a toll on me that um, it, it uh, yeah, it made my withdrawals deeper. It, uh, oh my God, it was, yeah, it was just like this vicious circle and spiral that I got into. And I didn't have the skills in place to recognize it soon enough. Hmm. How I'm about to ask this may seem a little like sensationalist, but how I'm the intent to asking it isn't, is mm. this something and that is probably one of the areas in the political world we don't talk about enough in terms of mental health. Right. And in terms of one of the, and you can, well, one of the things we talked about offline is the amount of, calls and emails and things that you've gotten that you were expected to perform at a certain way. And it was very rare that you got a good job and thank you for your service. Most yeah. of it was about the negative of what you've done and sure. I'm the taxpayer and I pay your salary kind of attitude. Yeah. And I can't imagine that helping a lot of men your mental health or really a lot of politicians mental health at this point. Yeah, I think that's something that people don't recognize, certainly, uh, about politicians. And there's a lot of other professions that are like this as well, is that um, nobody calls up their politician to say they're happy and they've done a really good job. They're doing a good job and they're really happy. With them. Nobody does that. When we get in touch with our representatives, it's either to tell them that we think they're an idiot to tell them that they, we think the government is an idiot uh, or to tell them to fix X or do what I want. Uh, otherwise I won't vote for you. I pay your salary. Um, so the so it's a pretty negative, your inputs at that level are pretty negative right across the board. Uh, and that, I mean, you know, I, I, I had, I had colleagues that I watched it. It was like water off a duck's back. Um, but for some people it isn't water off the duck's back. And I had, uh, man, I had constituents who, uh, could reduce me to tears. Uh, I can't let them know that, but I would get off phone calls and, and just close my office door and have a good week. Um, uh, when you're trying to help somebody and they're just telling you you're a pile of shit, you're not worth anything. Um, 
And uh, so other, you know, everybody is different. Everybody takes different. And uh, for me, it was a lot of times I could take it. But then when I couldn't, I, I needed a little bit of recovery time. We'll get into your self care part of that in, in, in a moment. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it, the other part of that is in is being a man. There yeah. is an, this stigma around men and you know crying and feeling sensitive. And I can relate because I'm a sensitive guy myself. Right. And taking sort of taking things to heart and uh, all that. It's sort of you know, did, did that make you feel less manly or, or how did that, like, was there an expectation? Well, well, you're a man and, you know, you got to be tough. Did you have that mentality being taught to you or how, how have you dealt with that? No, I didn't have that mentality. Uh, I've always been uh, secure in who I am as a, as a man, as a person, as a person, uh, I have, um, I, I, it wasn't that, um, it, it's, uh, I mean, you know, I said, I felt like a hypocrite because I was working to destigmatize, but in, in doing that, I was not actually fessing up to my own challenges and what I was going through as I was telling everybody else that they can do it. I was not doing that. So we're victims ourselves of our own sti- of stigma, right? We, we can advocate to remove stigma for other people, but then apply it to ourselves all the time. Um, I was always secure in that, but um, particularly for men, they don't know how to deal with it when you tell them because they're like, uh, and I think that that as men, we've all been trained. We know it is we're trained not to be that sensitive, that you don't show your feelings, that you are to be the dominant, strong one all the time. Uh, and um, uh, I can't deny that certainly I was raised in that type of uh, setting and those types of ex- expectations. Uh I have worked for a long time to be more empathetic, to, to do all, to, to work, to be a better person, not a better man, but a better person. Um, but, uh, yeah, I still have lots of work to do, but I think, um, yeah, because of all of that, when you do raise it or talk about it, um, men in particular have no, way how to deal with it my colleagues uh the male colleagues on city council never really talked to me about it they never asked uh there was one colleague who who did um but they never asked they may say hey i'm really sorry you're going through that um but they um they didn't and you gotta wonder in that going is it it doesn't scare them. Is that what we're trained to do is to be scared of those things, not just in ourselves, but in other men. And I mean, this notion of toxic toxic masculinity and, and, and what it does to men is really quite, really quite something. And I was just going to get into that too, because it's it's yeah. been something that that we we've talked about when we have the conversation around me too. But it really does fit here yeah. those the toxic toxic masculinity aspect of yeah. sort of we're, it, we can go to the pub, grab a couple of beers, and watch the football game and have a which is it's, fun, by the way. Absolutely, I I love football, and and there's nothing wrong with that. But to have that that in depth, how are you really doing today, Brian? How are you really yeah. doing today, Kevin? That that conversation seems to be tougher with men. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, I I have a couple of male friends that I can do that, that with. Um, that I feel comfortable in doing that with. 
uh, that I know they're not going to judge. They're going to be receptive. They'll ask the right questions. They'll be supportive. Uh, I don't have many of those. Um, and we're not, you know, we're not, we're not doing ourselves any service with that. I mean, we have to recognize that. So those stereotypical roles that I assume for centuries have been, uh, beaten into us, us men, uh, well, actually beaten into all of us, all people, uh, are not, are, are just not serving anybody. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and when you, yeah, just not serving anybody. Yeah. yeah. What, what are some questions that can be asked to kind of like, I, I wonder if part of this is, is, we don't know what the question is. And if it's the question's right, it's wrong. You feel kind of stupid or, or uh, ignorant. You, you, are you thinking about asking a question of somebody who's in depression? Yeah. Or like, well, like mental health? Yeah. In terms of that. Like, yeah. So, um, a lot of us tend to, when it's our friends or other people, uh, we tend to, we want to be there. We want to be supportive. And we say, to them, the classic response is we say, I will always be there for you. You just call me if you need me and when you need me. I'll be there. And they're being honest and they're being truthful and they're being helpful as they see it. On the receiving end of that, so I'm, in, I, I'm in an emotional mental health crisis. I am struggling just to stay um, alive, basically. Uh, I'm feeling like I'm a total burden to absolutely everybody in my world. Telling somebody about where I'm at feels like I'm just burdening them with it. Uh, And for them to honestly say and offer help by saying, I'm here, I'm just a phone call away. The last person the last thing I would ever do in that state is actually reach out to somebody and be an even greater burden to them. Um, So uh, there aren't the right questions to ask. There's only being and be there. Uh, You don't ask questions. You don't have to Uh, be there. Sit, uh, with a person show up and at at their place and, uh, and take them out, grab a coffee and sit on a park bench in the sun and don't say a word. Don't ask a question. Don't say a word. Just be a, just being there can make all the difference in the world. Uh, and when there's a safety and, uh, and comfort, uh, well, that actually, what you need is safety and comfort, mm-hmm. and uh, and so building that and and being safe and comfortable with a person who's going through a mental health crisis, who's going through uh, depression, who's uh, who's going through any number of things like that, is um, just being there for them is probably the biggest gift you can give them. The power of silence. Oh my God. It's wonderful. It, and I have, like, I know in my own life that there, there are friends that I have it and we'll just sit there and they'll be driving and, and we won't say anything. And it's, it's, and it's not awkward. No, it's not. It's, it's beautiful. We just don't have anything to say. We're just enjoying each other's company and we're, we're there. Yeah. But there's also this tendency in men to feel like we need to solve this problem. So, Brian, I need to fix you. That's my manly thing to do. I'm my conversation must get you out of this depression in some way, shape or form. And that silence feels awkward, but it's actually very powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, Uh, the silence is powerful. The 
the somebody somebody just being present for you is powerful and present doesn't mean you know having to ask the questions and speak present can take all being present with somebody can take all all kinds of all kinds of forms um uh empathy you know empathy is um uh an underrated and um, generally uh, probably um, a not a very strong thing in our society, and certainly not with men. Uh, and I don't want to characterize you know I, I, you throw general generalizations out like that, and and you know there's tons of exceptions to it all. And for, sure. for sure. So generalizations like that are not there, um, but empathy is is a missing component today and we're seeing it um showing up in political discussion and the way the the public discussions are happening around a whole variety of topics uh and uh it seems that empathy is lacking i i just picked up a book uh uh dr brian goldman's new book um i'm going to forget the full name but it's like it's the power of kindness or we need more kindness or something like that where he explores he's exploring uh empathy and kindness and um and and he comes from a position of being a emergency room doctor where you know you see people in distress all the time and how it, he felt it it had eroded his kindness and he wondered if he was a kind person anymore and so he goes out and he's exploring what is kindness what is empathy what does that look like what does what is it physiologically um and uh and how how do we get more of it okay. and i i'm reading it because i'm going holy crap we need more of it it is. It is. It it does feel like something we, as a society, lack. It it just. But yet, I feel like it's, a, it's something we're craving too, because I think we're there's a discovery that we are missing it. Yeah. And somewhere. Along- you know, that's why. It, I mean, uh, just that's why uh, disasters, as horrible as they are, can make you feel good. Because there's something right there that you can do for somebody else. And we all jump in, right? And we talk about the power of community and Calgary when they responded to the flood, when we respond to the fires in Slave Lake and Fort McMurray, when we respond to the fires in BC. Um, we all go, we all jump in to help people. And it feels good. And it feels good to do that for other people. And for two weeks, we talk about the power of community and this is who we are. And then we forget. And uh, I just wish we'd remember that a little bit more. Yeah, it's, I mean, even with, I mean, with Humboldt, it was, it's, you know, it was in our brain after yeah. the accident and then out and then back in when we saw the game last week and then yeah. I just saw a tweet, oh they won their oh they played other games. It's like, oh I forgot about them. And it's yeah. it's and yeah, it's just we live our lives and focused right. on ourselves first maybe to and yeah. not on other people. And it's the way that we I think we feel like we have to live and and we don't, maybe we don't know how to, it's almost like it, it needs to be a taught skill empathy in a sense. Maybe it's something that we need to bring more into the school curriculums. Yeah. And then I, the, I, I don't know. I actually believe that we all have it in us and that we don't have to be taught. Uh, we have to be, we have to feel safe. We have to feel secure in being able to do it. Right. We, we all have it in us and we don't have to be taught because of how we respond as a community to a crisis. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, and um, so we see it and it's spontaneous and it is uh, uplifting to see all of that. 
and you hang on to it as long as you can. Uh, and but it doesn't last very long. And then you sit there going, so why? Why? In Calgary, they want to lower, they're talking about lowering the speed limit right now to 30 in residential areas because people survive like exponentially higher rates when they're hit by a car at 30 kilometers an hour versus 50 kilometers an hour. It's about saving lives. It's about protecting children. But it means that your commute is going to be 30 seconds longer. Well, how dare we? You can't take 30 seconds of my time away from me. There's no common good in that attitude. There's no common good in that argument. Uh, It lacks empathy. It has zero empathy whatsoever. That attitude has zero empathy uh, for anybody else. And I sit there going, we can give up two weeks of our time and money to help people who in crisis. And yet we won't give up 30 seconds of our day to make sure that a child has a better chance of surviving if I hit them. And yet we would spend 30 seconds to five minutes in a coffee line to get our coffee to start. Our oh my God. Yes. Yes. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, I we're we're way off our original sort of mental health, men mental health, but I but I think but it does problem. come down to uh, and you know and toxic masculinity. Empathy is not something that you should have in that environment, and it it filters out when you don't have those. You know, it fills, filters out to a lot broader things like a fight over a 30 kilometer an hour speed limit to save people and you can't take, but, and the impact is 30 seconds. Um, uh, you know, is that the manifestation? How many, you know, and who's, who are the ones yelling? Probably men, <laughs> men the most uh, about that. And, you know, so yeah. Uh, don't tread on me. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Not in my backyard. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Which a lot of that, a lot of that has. And, to um, do yeah, I would have to say when it comes to, when it comes to a bunch of things, probably, uh, men feel that more, express that more. Hmm. So yeah. So I, I you know, how much of nimbyism is actually a result or a manifestation of, toxic mas- masculinity never i've never gone down that path in my head before but i wonder yeah it's a it's an interesting question to examine but there's a protection yeah. in us well, i feel like i have a protection when i see a, someone bullying someone or someone is out there attacking someone f- for no reason i feel right. like there's something in, within me that is like that I don't want to see the toxic man, but that aggressive part, like that was be more than willing to defend. And I feel like sure. in, in the right that men, there are, there's that protective side of us that is, that does stand strong per se, not necessarily. And it's not necessarily macho, but it's. Well, no, I know there's actually a better word for it. Yeah. And it, Cause what you're describing is classic chivalry. That's chivalry, and that's part of part of that paradigm. Uh, we must be chivalrous, and look at us for how chival- chivalrous we are. We are to be celebrated for our chivalry, um, and uh, and thanked for for our chivalry. It's chivalry is not a um, a selfless act. And you know the knights when they were chivalrous, they uh, they got the girl. You know they got promoted. Um, now we get our fifteen seconds of fame. Uh, um, you know we talk about our heroes who responded, and 
are they heroes if they're just doing what we all should be doing, which is looking out for each other? Yeah. But it might be that it, it feels so rare that we celebrate them as heroes. Well, there's been a term uh, coined the last few years that at first I think caught a little people off guard, but I think people are starting to understand that. And I, I, it's the benevolent sexism. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you mean by that? Uh, well, it's it's kind of your idea, what you're talking about, I feel like, where, you know, they open the door and uh, – a man opens the door for a woman, gets their coat. Um, it it kind of, in some ways, there it's been it's perceived as being gentlemanly or chivalrous, but in some ways, it's it's been also perceived as assuming that a woman cannot do these things themselves. Right and right and kind of may puts the man in this role of you know being the gentleman and the leader of the house and, you know, all that um, sort of thing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I th- you know, so, yeah, and, I, you know, I, I struggle with that, and I usually, you know, defer to how the woman feels about it. Um, it's interesting because, you know, my partner is uh, a very strong feminist, and the notion of men doing things for her are, uh, is like, no, I can do it myself. Um, but I open doors for her if I'm there first. I open doors for men that I don't know if I'm there first. Uh, if it's just you do it for a woman from the perspective of a power advantage, then that's actually not chivalrous. Uh, but if you are doing it because it's a polite, easy thing to do to make somebody else's life a little easier, um, that's just being a thoughtful human being. Yeah. So I think you're just being a thoughtful human being. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, you know, and a lot, yeah, a lot of those things, you know, uh, are, um, you know, it's like, why do men walk on the outside when you're walking on down a street? Do you know the origin of that one? No, it actually us. was shipless. Um, the origin of uh, always having the woman walk on the inside uh, comes from the Middle Ages when uh, um, people emptied their uh, honey pots into the street from the second floor in the morning. They would dump dump the, the sewage into the street and it all just flowed down the middle of the street. And if you were on the outside, if you were on the inside, you were more likely, you, you were less likely to be splashed. If you were on the outside, you were more likely to be splashed. So men uh, would walk with a woman, would walk on the outside to protect her from uh, being splashed from sewage. Hmm. (laughs) So, you know, we do it uh, and it feels innocuous. I was trained, I was trained as a kid, this is what men do. And you know, and you go back and you go, oh, okay, so it was a practical reason, maybe, back then. Uh, but um, but I was just trained, no, that's what men do. You protect the woman. So walking on the outside is a manifestation of protecting the female, putting her in a, um, in a minimized space. Hmm. Damn it, everybody's going to walk on the outside of yeah. me now. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, but you know, we have to look at those things and look at, uh, at, you know, and that's a pretty minor one. And I, and I don't want to take it, you know, and say, oh my God, this is like a horrible manifestation and men are bad for doing that. I will probably continue doing it. But I think that we need to look at a lot of these things uh, and try and understand where they come from. And try and understand how they may be perceived in others, um, and, and come back to that empathy thing, right? And try and understand how it might be perceived or taken um, 
by other people. Uh, and um, we, yeah, we, we generally don't think about that all that much. We think about how I take it. What does it look like from my point of view, right? And, um, uh, you know, in the depression piece, people were well-meaning, but, oh, man, uh, uh, I, it was, it was overwhelming for me. I mean, and then, oh, the, the worst thing about coming out, absolutely horrible worst thing about coming out were all of the people who said, thank you, you're brave. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, all of those. And I got hundreds of those kinds of messages and I had no capacity to deal with it whatsoever. None whatsoever. Um, and, uh, I had no idea. It was overwhelming. I stopped reading emails. I stopped reading comments because I, I, I just couldn't take it in. Uh, and then, uh, uh, people saying thank you or being, you know, going, I just had no capacity to take that in. Oh, tell you and your listeners a secret that nobody knows. Yeah. Um, I still can't take that kind of stuff in. And so when I left city council, uh, 11 months ago, uh, I got hundreds of emails. I got cards saying, thank you. You know, thank you for your service. It's been great having you here. Best of luck. All of those kinds of things. Um, I have not had the emotional capacity to read them. Uh, I didn't then. Uh, now I may, I've got a box of cards that I occasionally will open up and look at five and then put them away. Um, I have not had that emotional ability to absorb, um, positive reinforcement. I, I mean, it all feels like a lie. I, I, I still think I'm the biggest failure in the world. So, and if I could just do more, then I'll be okay. People will see me as being okay. Um, yeah, I I got all of those. I've got hundreds of them, and I just haven't been able to open them. Mm. It's a lot. It and it, it it's like it, I can, and I've I've had those not your like your situation, but I've I've been in, in similar situations where and it it feels to me like it's so overwhelming like it's yeah. you know almost i i personally like have felt guilty for not being able to do that oh I shouldn't oh no it. question i felt guilty yeah. and again you know and but we have um, if i said to people thanks for the card but i honestly i can't read it uh, I can't give you a reply on my email because it's too emotionally overwhelming. Uh, I even now I'm going, going well, I can never say that to anybody. Yeah, could they? because they're trying to be honest and supportive and thanking me. They're being genuine, um, and uh, and I don't feel like I have the ability or permission to do that to deflate their. Their genuine bubble. May I ask why? Why do you feel that way? Uh, um, hmm. I mean, because I don't feel like I've earned any of any thanks. Uh, I don't feel like I've earned any of that. Um, and, but I also know, and this is a learning to, uh, in situations like that, to just say, thank you. Um, uh, and, um, you know, because I actually have, I, if somebody has talked to me about the impacts on, other people when they say i just want to thank you or here's something to say thank you oh gosh no i didn't really do anything and blah 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 you know being humble mm -hmm. uh and uh or 
coming up with a, a rebuttal to their thinking I'm a, I did something good for them. Um, that has a pretty strong negative impact on the person that is, that is giving the compliment. And it, 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 it leaves them um, uh, not, it, it can leave them feeling bad. So I, to me, and, and it was a hard pattern to make. Uh, so now I just say thank you. But, oh my God, I just, uh, I don't deserve any of that. And um, I don't feel like I do. And uh, which means I can't accept it. Yeah. And I have no ability to accept it. I have no ability to understand any of that. Yeah. And is that a, that's probably just uh, a result of probably a lifetime of not, of having, of not being able to talk about emotions and feelings, uh, about uh, ignoring them, about not recognizing them. You know, I, with this bout of depression that started in 2013, and I have to say I'm not 100% out of it. I don't know if I ever will be, quite frankly. Uh, this, it, it was the deepest and longest that I'd ever been through. Uh, but I, with a counselor, started looking back and um, realizing that I, um, that I probably had, depressive bouts in my teen in my teenage years. Uh, and that, um, that the struggle started then and there was no ability to talk about it. There was, um, no support anywhere to, uh, um, be able to, to express myself in any way. You know, I bet you there was a lot of, men, a lot of people, men in particular, that have grown up in that situation. And uh, it, 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 didn't, it didn't serve me. I mean, I got it because I had at least a couple other serious depressive bouts, and they just got worse, and they got longer. I didn't do anything about them. Uh, it was, I was just going to snap out of it. Um, and, uh, then I hit this one and it was nearly the end of me. Mm. It was nearly the end of me. It's, it's the term, the snap out of it. Um, it's a common one that I, I'm sure has been a perception that you either told yourself in your, in your conversations or you've heard yourself or you've heard yeah. because we, we feel like it's, we talked about this earlier, it's in a role where you're in public or even as human beings, yeah. we don't take well to introverts and we don't take well to unhappy. How are you doing? Yeah. Great. How are you? Yeah. Um, yeah, those are meaningless questions. Uh, um, yeah, and... We, yeah, we don't, we don't take that moment. Uh, and we need to, I mean, none of this serves us. It certainly hasn't served me. And um, none of it, yeah, I don't think, I just, this notion that, particularly in men, that feelings are bad that you need to snap out of it, that um, uh, if only, all, all the if onlys, if only I could just do this, if only I just thought happy thoughts, if only, if only, if only. Uh, that's, those are all denial phrases and self-blame phrases. And we, you can't help, I mean, I couldn't help, I blame myself and to go and I was sliding into a very deep hole and for me to even be able to reach out to get a, to, to a counselor was 
the hardest thing. It took me two weeks. I would pick up the phone and then I put it down. And then the next day I pick up the phone and I put it down. And the day after I pick up the phone and I dial a number and I'd hang up before it started ringing. Um, and that went on for two weeks until I could finally go through with it because it felt like admitting defeat. And then I fought. I didn't want to take drugs because taking drugs and medication is, uh, is, is admitting failure, is admitting that you're defeated. Uh, and um, I didn't and want to take drugs where, you know, uh, and because that's an admission, uh, that there is something really wrong with you that, um, and, you know, I still take drugs. I still, I, I may, and I've been warned to be prepared for this. I may be taking them for the rest of my life. Uh, I don't want to. Um, but you know what, in the last few months, I started sliding into the hole again, and, uh, I recognized the signs earlier, which is part of that self-care piece. One of the things is I'm trying to learn to recognize my trigger, my signals, not my triggers, my signals earlier that I am sliding. Um, and, uh, about four months ago, three, four months ago, I started losing weight again and eating. I wasn't interested in eating and sleeping was becoming more difficult. And I was sort of listening to myself talk. And I was like, okay, I think I'm recognizing this and, uh, I better go and check in. And I did. And, um, I, I am so bloody lucky to have the most amazing doctor. Uh, and, uh, and she never gave up on me. When I was ready to give up, she never gave up on me. And so I went and saw her a few months ago, and she's like, okay, let's do some tweaking. Let's talk about this and getting into counseling, psychology, psychologists um, more. And uh, But, you know, I look at it and I go, okay, I, this is better because I, I, I recognize the signs, and I didn't get too far down the hole um, before I was able to stop so yeah that's that's a huge success i think it sounds like you have a really powerful support network too hmm. uh yeah i do actually um i am now that i can have the ability to recognize it uh i do i really do i've got um yeah, I have some pretty amazing friends, and uh, um, and and I discovered <laughs> I've discovered through this I've discovered some pretty amazing friends. Mm-hmm. I used to be a guy who said I didn't really have friends. So yeah, all in all, uh, the depression is still there in one one form or another, but. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm getting better at learning the triggers. That's what I want is have better self-care and coping skills um, because it will and it does come back. And how do I interrupt that? How do I, how am I going to be able to talk to other people to that safe network that I never, I probably had before. I just never recognized it. Um, And, uh, and that, and being able to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And just to say, to say to Joe, oh, buddy, I'm not in a good place. And he knows, right? And he understands. And he will just say, let's go grab a beer and not and listen to some music. And uh, that's all. And it, it's great. Yeah, but I, I but it it comes from me, and and I have to say, talking about it is still really difficult. Actually, saying that to Joe, I am not in a good place. It was a really hard thing. It was something I was like, I just shouldn't tell him. It'll go away. I can get through this. Um, if only I can just buck up. Um, 
So I had to give myself a real good talking to, to be able to say that to Joe, to say that to my partner. So, and yeah, and we all have those support networks. I think we just, most of us just don't recognize them. That's true. I think, I think that that's the, that's, it's, it's out there. It's just, if, if you're in a space where you don't see it, it's hard to see. Yeah. When you're in that dark place, it's like, I, I can't see it. I'm sorry. I know, I know that you're there, but I can't, I'm sorry. I'm unable to see that at this time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we just have to be able to talk about it more. I mean, and it's different for everybody. And more people are suffering than you know, than we know. And you never know who it could be. Um, uh, yeah, it's, you, you never, you never know who it could be. The, the being vulnerable piece on social media, hmm. we talked a little bit about what how you got there in terms of of that earlier but kind of accidentally yeah, yeah. <laughs> when people do you feel what do you how what are your thoughts about going pu- the public conversations around this it would you would you suggest caution or would you oh. Would you make sure that you, is this something, I, I, I mean, I know that this is going to be different for everybody and I think that that's a fair answer, but are we being too vulnerable or? Oh of, God, no. no, we're not being too vulnerable. No, uh, no, not at all. The conversations are just starting. We're just starting to be able to talk about this. We have such a long way to go. Um, you know, and it, 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 you know, it reveals itself in a whole variety of ways. Um, you know, uh, what's playing out right now in the United States with the Supreme Court um, nominee yeah. uh, is a manifestation of exactly that. It's the same thing. Uh, um, we, it just manifested, manifests differently. Uh and, um, but no, we're just starting the conversation around, uh, how we can be better people about how we can talk about these things in a very safe manner. I, I don't, uh, I don't feel still, I don't feel safe talking about my mental health issues, um, with too many people. I mean, this this is easy because it's, I'm looking at my computer screen, and uh, um, there's nobody in the room, and uh, so this is easy, um, and I can you know I can pretend that you don't know, have a really good podcast and nobody ever listens to it, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, now you're in my head. <laughs> no, I'm in your head. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I, so, um, so I don't, yeah, I don't feel, I still don't feel safe. We, we got such a long way to go. I, I, when I was a counselor a few years ago, I showed emotion, uh, once and, uh, I, it was an interview and, um, I, I kind of teared up a little bit. I, I choked up. And, oh, my God, this was three years ago. Oh, my God, the abuse that I received um, on social media and uh, in the comment sections on, in news stories and in my inbox was really quite amazing, uh, all because I had showed some emotion. Mm. And... Uh, that was three years ago. So, hey, are we talking about it too much? Not even close. 
not even close. I mean, look, God, how much is Justin Trudeau being attacked right now? Because he sheds a tear over things, that he gets emotional at other people's trauma and what has been done to other people. He feels empathy and he expresses that empathy through his own emotions and he gets lambasted. We're not even close to talking about it enough. Hmm. And, and you know, with Trudeau, I think it's a gift. I think that that's one of his strengths is his empathy. Yeah. I think that, the, you know, you can say that there were other strengths that Harper had, but right. it was empathy was not on Harper's strength. No, no, no. Don't think so. Yeah. It's, and so it, it's a, you know, and even Obama, that was a strength that he had, that he was yeah. empathetic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, where do we go from here? Hmm. Like you, you said that we're we've we've just scratched the surface of, in yeah. terms of actually talking about this in a meaningful manner. Hmm. Um, if you, where where do we go? So, the conversation right now that we're having, and it's a start, is around how um, mental health, mental illness uh, um, is an illness and that it shouldn't be stigmatized and people should feel free and open to talk about it, to be supported in it. Um, And so the focus is completely on that. It's on how to help how to help the sufferers um, to be able to talk about it. I think where we need to get to, and that's a good start in the conversation, but I think where we need to get to is to actually turn to the conversation to the rest of us and not say, how do they get, why don't they, and how do we get them to speak out, but have it, the rest of us look at it and go have the conversation about and how do we receive it and how do we feel that kindness how do we regain that kindness and that empathy uh towards uh other people Uh, and um so i think that's that's where we need to get to because quite frankly if If we're getting, if, you know, I speak out and I'm speaking out about it and, you know, I get a few people that go, oh, that's really great. But, uh, you know, and congratulations and well done. Uh, But the attitude that, you know, that I get or if I mention it to somebody and they get really uncomfortable and they won't make eye contact, that actually has has done me no good whatsoever speaking out. I've just reinforced that I shouldn't speak out. So we need to look at how we have the conversation around how to be that empathetic, supportive receiver of people speaking out, people sharing. I don't think we know how to do that. It's a struggle. Yeah. Right. And that's why I'm reading Dr. Goldman's book um, and uh, on kindness. And I just, uh, it's because, you know what, I just, I want to learn how to be a kinder person. I want to learn how to be able to be present and be more empathetic and, um, Take the time to do that. Take the 30 seconds to do that. The power of kindness, why empathy is essential. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I've, I just started reading it. It's, it's uh, pretty wonderful. And he's, it's a self exploration as much as anything. So. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I think it's so, it's, it's so important to, you know, um, and how to give it, how to receive it. It's, it's, it's a challenge, I think for humans, not only for men. I mean, I, I assume that there's 
it's maybe different challenges for women, but there's it's challenges. I don't want to assume yeah. anything for how they go through that, but it's I'm assuming it's different and yeah. it's humans. Oh, need. I mean, of course there are challenges, and and it's been recognized uh, in women a little bit, you know, um, uh, and uh, the challenges that they face. There are some great songs about that very thing, the Rolling Stones, Mother's Little Helper, um, Marian Faithful, The Eyes of Lucy Jordan, which is my favorite song by her, but that's about um, that hopeless, they're, they're about the hopelessness and, and the lack of meaningful escape. Um, and, uh, you know, God knows, women, they, yes, we all, we're humans. We go through this and the stereotypical gender roles that we've imposed on ourselves, manufactured for ourselves and imposed on ourselves are not serving us any longer. Yeah. No. And we're realizing that, I think, slowly. but sure. uh, I think so. I hope so. Is there anything else we need to touch on before we, we wrap this up or... Well, we kind of went all over the place, didn't we? Um, uh, we could talk about world food hunger, uh, <laughs> um, the differences uh, between proportional and direct, um, uh, proportional representation and first past the post. We could talk hey, about... Hey, that's coming up here in BC. We, uh, we, 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 we should like... talk about, should we ban breeds of dogs? Um, but no, I think we've done enough on this one. <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know what you're up to, maybe kind of tell us a little bit what you're doing now. And the- uh, What am I doing now? Well, it's been uh, 11 months since I left my job. Um, I, uh, I, did a, I did a solid three-month complete disconnect. I left, I left town for two months and went wandering, which I highly recommend. I you know, went down to South America and wandered um, a little bit in Chile. Uh, and um, I also got all new contact information, and I didn't tell anybody, which is even better. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I did that full disconnect. And then when I, in the beginning of February, I thought, oh, time to re-engage with the world. Uh, I started, I continued doing the stuff that I've been working on as a city councilor because it's the stuff that I became really, really passionate about there. So I'm, I'm working on how do we have a, I'm exploring how, from a policy perspective, how we have a better affordable housing system for our province, for Alberta. Um, I'm doing work to, I'm uh, involved in, in the arts sector and, uh, and trying to see how we support the arts sector and get more funding into it because it's a sector that's in crisis. I'm doing a little bit of work around indigenous issues and indigenous relations and trying to do more in that area. Um, uh, doing stuff in the poverty poverty circle uh, as well as climate change and uh, trying to move um, move the ball forward in, in how we address climate change. Mm. That's a few things. Keeping busy. I uh, yeah, I hate to get bored. Mm. I got bored. I also worry, quite frankly, if I got if I got bored or wasn't busy, I worry, and this is something that is something I still need to work on. I, I worry that I'll, if I am not busy, that I'll slide into a hole. So um, I need to get myself to a place through self-care and where that's not a worry. And where can people find you? Oh, you know what? I I wander around Twitter, at, which is my handle is at B Pincott. Um, that's the only kind of social media that I use from a uh, public uh, public persona kind of perspective. My my Facebook page, of which you've been a friend of mine on Facebook for a long time. Yes. Uh, um, my Facebook page is really quite personal. If anyone goes to my Facebook page right now, they would see my profile picture and go. Okay, this isn't really his public persona. I'm going, yeah, no, no kidding. Um, I, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and you'll just find me at different things around Calgary. 
Well, I, I, I want to say that I really appreciate your integrity and your vulnerability and your honesty, uh, this conversation. Um, I, yeah, we were all over the place, but I think, I think a lot of people are going to take a lot out of what you've had to say. And there's, there are some things that we have to, that we get to think about. And it was an right. absolute privilege to have this conversation. Oh, my pleasure. But don't forget, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy. Of course. Of course I, you are. But I'm not, I'm not a font of wisdom. I'll have a, I'll have a really good conversation. But I'm not. I, I, I think that you're, you are, I think you have, I think you're more of a flaunt of wisdom than, than you, you have a lot of wisdom there. I, I, you know. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> see, I'm doing what I'm not supposed to do. I'm supposed to say, thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I understood that that was going to happen, but I, I felt <laughs> in here, in my gut that I had to still say it anyway. So <laughs> there you go. Um, All right. Follow me, Facebook, Kevin Olenek, uh, Twitter, KVOLE, SoundCloud, Spreaker, KVOLE. Subscribe on iTunes, Agree or Disagree, the podcast, YouTube as well. Uh, a couple other things coming up. We've got C- Kristen Rawworth is coming. will be scheduled. We're going to do that this weekend. Uh, I think I butchered her name as well. And the daddy oh. blogger, Ricky Shetty, will be joining us as well coming up. So we'll talk to you all soon. Bye for now.